Hi everyone, I'm Catherine from the MSC Science Festival. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for our Science After Dark series. Um, we are talking about science and space tonight. Um, our first talk of the evening will be joined by Dr. Elias Eide. Um, after his talk, we'll take a short 30 minute break and then we'll be joined at 8 p.m. by Dr. Shannon Schmoll, director of the MSU Abrams Planetarium. Um, Please be sure to share all of your astronomy related questions in the comment section. Um, Dr. Schmoll will be joining us for Q&A um, right after. So without further ado, we'll start our first presentation. Hello, MSU SciFast enthusiasts. My name is Elias Eide. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the Physics and Astronomy Department at Michigan State University. And today I'm going to take you on a cosmic journey to meet our ancestors. Yes, you hear that correctly. Today I'm going to talk about our ancestors, although it's an astronomy talk. Well, during the talk, you will understand why the title of my talk is Our Ancestors. Before I start, I would like to start with some introduction and tell you a, bit, a little bit about what an astronomer does. And I always find this meme as a great uh, representation to give the perspective of people when they hear from me that I'm an astronomer. A lot of people think that we are stargazers, we sit under the night sky, and we enjoy a glass of wine while looking at the sky. Well, I hope that that would be true, but actually it's not. We do enjoy the night sky, but this is not our main job. Also, we're not, we are not rocket scientists and we are not astronauts for sure. And definitely we are not astrologers. Astrology is a something completely different from astronomy or astrophysics. One of them is science, which is of course astronomy. The other one is not. And uh, what of course an astronomer job entails is studying the astronomical objects like planets, galaxies, and stars, actually studying the physics of these objects. That's why we call it astrophysics. And of course our work entails a lot of computer work and programming, that's why this memes uh, show this uh, programming uh, window. Now, uh, before I start every astronomy talk, I always like to uh, give some introduction about three parameters in this universe, which are the distances, the numbers, and time. And once we are able to grasp these, uh, these three parameters, we can delve more into our topic. Starting with distances, the nearest star to our solar system, to us, is, is, is called Proxima Centauri. And this star can only be seen from the southern hemisphere. We cannot see it from the northern hemisphere. And it is at four light, at four light years away from us. And when I say a light year, a light year is a measure of distance and not a measure of time. It is the distance traveled by light during a year. So imagine light the fastest speed we know of, 300,000 kilometer per second. And in order to know this distance, we have to derive how much this light has traveled during a year. So when I say that Proxima Centauri is four light years away from us, it means that light takes four years to travel between us and Proxima Centauri. Or in other words, if you have a ship that can travel in the speed of light, you need four years to reach Proxima Centauri. So this is always the case in astronomy. We are always study, studying the past of the stars, of the planets, of the universe. Because as I said, the light takes four years to reach us from the nearest star to us, and vice versa. So if, let's say there is a planet, actually there are planets around this system of stars, and let's say some of these planets are habit habitable, they host life, and there's an intelligent civilization on one of these planets. They have a giant telescope and they are looking 
at Earth. More precisely, they are looking at our favorite campus, Michigan State University. They won't see the campus empty right now from students due to the coronavirus situation. They would see how campus was four years ago. Right now, they will see how the campus was four years ago. They will see campus full of students. They wouldn't know that there is a very harsh situation now that we are suffering from. Actually, if you want to send them a message that we have a pandemic here on Earth, they will only receive our message for years in the future. Our sky is full of stars. And let's say there is a star that is at a distance of 50.8 light years away from us. Why this particular uh, distance? Because if also there is a intelligent civilization on one of these stars and they are looking at Earth, they will see how Earth was 50.8 years ago. And actually, this date will bring us back to the 20th of July, 1969. And instead of they pointing their giant telescope towards Earth, if they pointed towards the moon, they will be able right now to watch the moon landing live. And they will see Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin putting the first human uh, step on the lunar surface. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years across, which means if you have the speed of light, you need 100,000 years to travel from one side of the galaxy to the other. And now let's say we left our galaxy and we want to go to the nearest galaxy to us, which is Andromeda or M31. Andromeda is at a distance of around 2.5 million light years away from us. Which means again, if there's an intelligent civilization with a giant telescope looking from Andromeda at Earth right now, they won't see any of the intelligent civilization that we have now on Earth, they will see this. It's called Homo habilis. It's one of our ancestors, which been roaming Earth to around 2.5 million years ago. Homo habilis means handyman because it's one of our first ancestors that, is, that has started to use tools. Well, if I keep talking for hours, it's really difficult to explain how big is our universe, but they always say that a photo or a picture worth a thousand words. And our friend at NASA uh, do believe this. And what they did is they used the Hubble Space Telescopes to point it toward, towards a very small patch in the, in the sky. You can see this small patch in this rectangle, in the small rectangle, comparing compared to the full moon. It's in a it's patch, there's only a few stars in it. It's very dark. And they pointed the Hubble Space Telescopes for around a month, obtaining continuous images, collecting, collecting, collecting light and images. And after one month, they got this. Each dot in this photo is an entire galaxy on its own. All what we're seeing is actually galaxies, some of them at billions of light years away from us. We estimate that our observable universe, what we can see from our universe, has around 93 billion light years in diameter or across. This is how big is the observable universe. There might be a lot outside of our observable universe. It is just that our universe is not old enough for us to receive light from there. Now, the second uh, parameter that I would like to talk about is numbers. And we already see how big the numbers I'm talking about. But if we're talking about our galaxy, our galaxy contains around 100 billion stars. So other than our sun, you can see this is our sun, a dot and this artistic impression of our galaxy. Of course, we cannot take images of our galaxy because we are in it. If you're wondering about planets, in our galaxy alone, we estimate that most of stars have planets around them, and therefore there might be hundreds of billions of planets in our galaxy. Around the mass alone, the continuous in the observable universe, there might be around 100 to 200 billion galaxies 
larger or smaller than alpha. So if you want to know how many stars there are in the universe, you just have to multiply 100 billion times 100 billion. You will get a number of one followed by 22 zeros. This is how much stars there is in the observable universe. The last uh, parameter that I would like to talk about is time. And usually when we talk about the average life of a human being, we talk about dozens of years, so like 80 years, 70 years. But when we're talking about the lifetime of stars, we're talking about millions and billions of years. For example, a star like our sun, our sun has been around for around 4.5 billion years. And our sun will stay there for another 5 billion years. We are talking about billions. Our universe has been around for 13.7 billion years now. And this is the current estimate of the age of the universe. And now I'm done with my introduction and it's time to talk about our ancestors. Of course, if you ask a biologist who are our direct ancestors, they will tell you or they will show you this picture, which is a picture of how we think of the first homo sapiens looked like because we are homo sapiens. This is our race. However, if you ask an astronomer who are our ancestor or what are our ancestors? Well, for me, the answer is the stars. Why is that? Because when the universe started with a big inflation that we call now the Big Bang, the universe was too hot for any atoms to form. But when the universe was expanding and started to cool down, after four, around 400,000 years from the Big Bang, atoms started to form. And these atoms were mainly hydrogen and helium. What I'm showing here is an artistic impression of, of what we think the evolution of the universe looked like. So it started as a Big Bang and until our days now. And if the universe started with only hydrogen and helium, I'm sure you are wondering now, where does all the elements in the periodic table come from? And again, the answer is the stars. Well, when we talk about the evolution of stars, we usually divide these stars into two categories. One we call the sun-like stars or like the low mass stars or intermediate mass stars, stars like our sun. And then we have the massive stars, stars like, that have eight or 10 times and even much more the mass of the sun. I'm going to start with the first type, the sun-like stars. And any star in general, massive star or low mass star, would form from a giant cloud of gas and dust, which collapse under its own gravity to form a star. When the star collapses under its own gravity, the temperature in its core rises a lot and will have some kind of a nuclear reactor in the core of star fusing hydrogen atom into heavier elements like helium. During this process of hydrogen fusion, the star emits a lot of energy or these reactions emit a lot of energy. And this is actually the energy that we receive from our sun. And this energy it is responsible for the balance of star between the forces of gravity and of course the forces of nuclear fusion. And as long as the star is fusing hydrogen inside its core, it would be living in balance. But all stars die. And here's a, another schematic impression of what we think the evolution of our sun look like. So we start from the birth of star from a, new, from a giant cloud of gas and dust that collapse under its own gravity. And then the star starts using hydrogen in its core and living normally. But at some point, this star will run out of its fuel, which is the hydrogen in the core, and it will start to die. This would only happen in 5 billion years from now for our sun, or like 4 billion years from now for our sun. When this happened, First of all, there's no more energy output from the core. So the core started contracting more and the energy or the temperature rises higher. But on the other hand, the 
outer layers of the star started to puff up or expand, and the, jaw, and the star turned into what we call a red giant. When the core collapses and the temperature in the core rises, the core start in the core, we have now nuclear reactions of helium fusion into heavier elements. These elements are carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And therefore, now the star is forming heavier elements that didn't exist in the universe when it first started. At some point, the star starts to lose its outer layer and emitting a lot of material in the universe and emitting a lot of carbon and oxygen in the universe and enriching you know, the universe with heavier elements. Once the star loses its outer layers, the remnant is the hot core of star, which we call the white dwarf. So that was the scenario of the life end of a star like our sun. And uh, as you can see, these stars, they don't die in a very dramatic fashion, unlike more massive stars, because these stars have a much more dramatic fashion in ending their life. And also for these stars, their lifetime is much uh, shorter than stars like our sun. Stars like our sun live for billions of years, however, more massive stars live for only millions of years or hundreds of millions of years. Because although they have much more mass and much more fuel, they burn this fuel in a faster rate. So in uh, different words, live fast, die young. Now, after these stars run out of fuel, they turn into what we call red supergiants much bigger than red giants. And if you want to just try to understand how big these stars are, this is a comparison between two red super giants, Betelgeuse and Antares, and our sun, which is this very small dot we see here. During this phase of red super giant, again, the star puff up, but its core contracts and start using helium into heavier elements like carbon and oxygen, and then they contract more and fuse carbon and, and oxygen into heavier and heavier elements. So these stars form a lot of heavy elements all the way to iron. And then the nuclear reaction stops. They cannot fuse iron. But they actually formed a lot of heavy elements that we have in our periodic table of elements. Now, once the nuclear reactions stop in their cores. They can't fuse iron anymore. What would happen to these stars or these giant stars is that their outer layers, they would collapse because there's no more forces that can halt the forces of gravities. And they would bounce back on the core, forming a giant explosion that we call supernova. And during the supernova explosion, all the heavy elements or all the elements that we know of in the periodic table are formed. So elements like uranium, plutonium, these elements are formed in supernova explosion. Also, of course, there are diff different type of explosions like neutron, neutron star mergers that form also a lot of other elements like gold, for example, they form a lot of gold. But during supernova explosions, uh, a lot of heavy elements are formed. Now, if you are wondering what would happen to Betelgeuse, which is a red supergiant, and it's very famous in the constellation of Orion, what would happen if Betelgeuse goes out of supernova? Because it should at some point. Well, if Betelgeuse goes out as supernova today, we will only see it brightening in 600 years from now, because Betelgeuse is at a distance of 600 light years away from Earth, and therefore, if it goes off today as a supernova, we'll only know about that in 600 years from now. And if Betelgeuse start brightening tonight in the night sky, it means that it has went off as a supernova 600, 600 years ago. And now if we go back to the evolution of our universe. The universe started as a Big Bang and then started forming and then like hydrogen and helium atoms started to form. And when the first stars started to form from helium and hydrogen, there were giant stars, 
they exploded as supernovae and they enriched the universe with heavy elements, which then was another cycle of stars who were born. And these stars had more heavy elements and they formed planets around them and maybe even life around these planets. Because if you look at the basic ingredient of the human body, we see that there are oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, calcium, and a lot of other elements. And these elements were forged in the core of the stars and during star explosions. We are made of stardust because almost every atom in our body came from star that died billions of years ago. And the atom in our left hand probably came from a different star than the ones in our right hand. How poetic is that? And that's why when someone asks me about our, our ancestors, my answer is always the stars. Now, what would happen after a supernova explosion? What would happen to the star? Well, during the supernova explosion, of course, the outer layer are uh, emitted and ejected in the universe or in the, in the galaxy. But the core of, star, of the star will start contacting furthermore and collapsing under its own gravity to form what we call a neutron star. This star is very dense that electrons and protons started to merge to form neutrons. And that's why it's called a neutron star. So we have almost the mass, two times the mass of our sun, all collapsed in a size in a star which has the size of a small city, like New York, for example. This is how, well, New York is a big city, but I mean, in diameter, it would be like a few kilometers. This is how dense this star is, or a neutron star is. Actually, if we manage somehow to take a teaspoon from a neutron star, this teaspoon will weigh more than Mount Everest. We're talking about millions of kilograms. And if the star is a little bit more massive, the contraction will continue and the star form a black hole. So actually a black hole is a collapse of the core of a giant star or massive star after it goes off as a supernova. Why is it called a black hole? Because it is so dense and the gravity is so high, even light cannot escape from these objects. The fastest thing in the universe cannot escape from the gravity of these objects. That's why they are called black hole. So black hole, as we think of it, is a point of infinite density that we call singularity. And around it, there is a radius of no return that we call the event horizon. And if you approach the black hole closer than this event horizon, there is no way for you to come back. Even light cannot do it. How do we know that there is a black hole if they don't emit light? Because as I said, even light cannot escape from them. Well, we see the effect of the black hole on its surrounding. Because black holes are so massive and their gravities are so high, they bend space-time around them. So if you are looking at objects in the background of a black hole, we see that the light coming from these objects, from these galaxies, is distorted by the gravity of the black hole, which distorted the space-time around it. Also, sometimes we see the black holes eating stars around them, swallowing stars around them. We see a firework of light going in some place in the universe where we see a star being eaten out by something. We don't know what is this thing, but we know that there is a black hole there, although we cannot see it which when this black hole is eating the star. If you're wondering what would happen to you if you approach a black hole, well, what will happen is that the gravity on your feet would be higher than the gravity of your head. So your body starts to elongate and would look like actually spaghetti. It has a term, an actual term for it. It's called spaghettification. So we just learned today the life evolution of a star like our sun and also the 
dramatic fashion that massive star dies off and how much uh, elements, heavy elements they produce and enrich the universe with. But for a take home message, I guess there are two important take home message from this talk. One of them is that stars die. And the other one is that they are our ancestors. But the most important uh, lesson from astronomy in general is the sense of humbling that astronomy should teach us when we see how insignificant we are in time and space. And also when we look at our planet from space, this image here has been taken during Apollo 13 mission which failed to land on the lunar surface and instead did a three days orbit around the moon. And during Christmas Eve or on Christmas Eve in 1970, I guess, or 71, I can't remember correctly, uh, the astronauts on board of Apollo 13 managed to take this image from of Earth rising and on in front of the moon. And when we look at our planet from the moon, we don't see any borders. We don't see any races. We don't see any differences. It's just one small planet with one race, one human race living on this planet. So especially in these difficult times that our planet is going through and our race is going through, we should always remember that we are all one human race living on this small pale blue dot. Thank you very much.